Okay, do you have your Bible? Do you have your Bible open? Mark, Mark. 1 verse 4. Now before we do that, I wanted to turn to the person on your left, on your right, and I want you, I'm going to count to three, and I want you to speak life over them. Will you do that? I, I, I want you to say, um, I see a red Ferrari, or you're going to get married tomorrow. I see your wife appearing in the cloud. I, I don't want you to say anything like that. I wanted to speak life into them, the person next to you. Will you do that? Is that okay? Okay, nothing weird. Just say, I speak life over you, joy and peace, and I'll build you up and I'll edify. Okay, let's do it. One, two, three. Come on, speak loud over somebody. So I bless you. I speak the favor of the Lord over your life. Mag die gins van die Heere jou volg. Amen. Okay, so did you speak life over somebody? Okay, now, just as you've done that, you touched the person next to you and you spoke life over them, Right now, you have to realize that you actually built the kingdom of God when you did it. Amen? Can I get an amen? You have to know that when you bless the person next to you, when you said something good, or when you've built up the person next to you with good words, or by prophesying over them, you've been building up the kingdom. We know the kingdom of God is not a building, it's not a place. The kingdom of God is us. Amen? And if we can build each other up, then we are building the kingdom of God. But if we are breaking each other down, then we are destroying the kingdom of God. Now we've been preaching on the kingdom from the beginning of, of this year. And if you were not here, please, you have to go and get the CDs or the DVDs or go onto Facebook, go and like the church, go and listen to the sermons. But if you've missed it, you have to go and listen to it because we are getting somewhere at this moment. Amen. And the Lord's been moving, doing awesome things. We've been preaching about being in the kingdom of God, what it means to walk in the kingdom. Because the Bible says, preach the gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel. We have to preach the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. And I want to recap just before we go on, is that Jesus, when he appeared 40 days after the crucifixion, after he rose up from the dead, Jesus appeared for 40 days, the Bible says, speaking on the things of the kingdom. Amen. When Paul went into the city once again. The Bible says for 40 days, he spoke about the things concerning the kingdom. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and everything shall be given unto you. Everything else. When Jesus spoke on the mountain, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, he spoke about the things of the kingdom. It's always about the things of the kingdom. If we forget about the kingdom, then we lose vision, we, have, we, we lose hope, we lose the plan that God has for us, and we get lost. The Bible says without vision, people perish. So the Bible says your vision should be the kingdom. So we should focus on the kingdom every day and how we're supposed to build the kingdom. Now, Jesus, everywhere he went, spoke about the kingdom. John the Baptist, repent and be baptized, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It is so close, you can almost touch it. But people do not live on this earth and forget about the kingdom. We pray that our Father, our Father who art in heaven, let's all pray together. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. But not just thine kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. See, the Bible is, is, is almost as if, if God was an architect and he put everything together. Everything in the Bible is together for a reason. We say thy kingdom come, thy will be done in one sentence for a reason. Because it is God's will for his kingdom to come on this earth. Amen. That's why we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On this earth as it is in heaven. So as the will of the Lord is done in heaven, so we are praying for his will to be done on this earth. As his kingdom is in heaven, we are praying for his kingdom to come on this earth. So we have to understand that is God's will. So when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, I remember a while ago at a school, I made a mistake. I said, Nebuchadnezzar came to Jesus. It's not Nebuchadnezzar, it's Nicodemus. So when Nicodemus came to Jesus saying, Jesus, how do you do these signs, miracles, and wonders? And Jesus didn't give him five steps to do signs, miracles, and wonders. Jesus said to him, you have to be born again. Amen? 
And now since the beginning of the year, we've been preaching about what it means to be born again, how we can walk in the kingdom. So it doesn't help if we preach the kingdom and everybody hears the gospel of the kingdom, but they are not born again. Then it's only a half a marathon that we are running. We're not finishing the job. Are you all with me? If we preach the kingdom of God, we have to get people born again so that they can walk in the kingdom of God. Amen? Jesus said to the Pharisees, said, Pharisees, you yourselves do not enter into the kingdom and you shut the doors in men's faces so that they cannot get into the kingdom. So our goal is to preach the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom, and to let people understand what the kingdom of God is. And when they understand what the kingdom of God is, they must receive and have the desire to live in this kingdom. Why do I want to live in the kingdom of God? Because it's like heaven. Amen? The kingdom that is in heaven come on this earth. So it is like heaven. Who doesn't want to go to heaven? Who doesn't want to be in heaven? You see, in, in, the, in the kingdom of heaven, there is peace, there's joy, there's worship, there's, there's happiness, there's co- per- complete perfected bodies, no pains, no discomfort. No, it's, everything is perfect in heaven, amen? There's no tears in heaven, there's no sadness, no fear, no depression, no stress, anxiety. It's perfect in heaven. So we want, Jesus said that we must get that heaven here on this earth. So we spoke about it the last couple of weeks, and I think if you've been here, the last couple of services, you know what the kingdom of God is all about, amen? I don't think you struggle to understand, because we explained it over and over again in many different ways and from many different angles. But we know that we have to walk in the kingdom of God. I want to be in His kingdom. I want to live in His kingdom. Because Jesus said over and over again, my kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is here. So one Sunday we spoke about saying that we don't have to die to go into the kingdom. Jesus died to bring it here. Amen? So we must forget the idea that we have to die and then go into the kingdom. Jesus died to bring the kingdom here for us. To walk in and live in every single day. So Jesus spoke to... to, to, (laughs) Almost. (laughs) Nicodemus, <laughs> I almost said, I made a joke about it, I almost did it again. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus and he said to him that a man ought to be born again. Unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. Now we have to understand, and that's why we're so happy because we baptized so many people last Sunday. Because Jesus spoke to Nicodemus saying, unless you are born again by what? By water and by the Spirit. So Jesus explained to him, you have to be born again by water and by Spirit. But the Bible also tells us that if, if any one of us believes that Jesus is the Son of God, he is born again. But this born again means you are born from above. Look at somebody, tell them, not just born again, you are born from above. You are born from above. So this, this, this new born or this new life the Bible speaks of, of this new resurrection life, the born again power of the Holy Spirit speaks not, not just of being born again. It's very important that you always remind yourself you are born from above. The Bible tells us that if, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is what? He is a new creation. The old things have passed and the new things have come. So we have to understand that that when we are born again by the water, the goal is to put away the old life and the worldly life. And when we rise up out of the water, it tells us that you are now living the resurrection life of Jesus. You are born from above. Amen. You're not born of this world, but you are born from above. So you don't belong to the world, but you belong to your Father that is in heaven because He gave you your new life. Amen. Look at somebody say, I am born from above. I am born from above. So Jesus explained to him, saying, Nicodemus, you have to be born again. If you want to live in the kingdom that is from heaven, you have to be from heaven. Amen. 
If you want to walk in the kingdom of heaven, you need to come from that kingdom in heaven. So the Bible says that we are not born again by natural seed, but we are born again by incorruptible seed, which comes from God. So as you are sitting in this place, and if you have been born again by the Holy Spirit and by the water and by believing that He is the Son of God, then you are born again. You are a new creation. Last Sunday, I said to the guys before we baptized them, I said, you're not pimped. Amen? Like pimp my ride. You are not pimped. They didn't take an old car and pimp it, put new tires and more radio than car in it. <laughs> okay, you are not pimped, you are not upgraded, you are not made better, you are made completely new. It's as if the old car that you were is scrapped, amen? It's in the junkyard, it's, it's, it's buried, it's over, it is gone, and they rolled in a brand new car onto that track, amen? So you are a new creation, you are not pimped, you are not upgraded, amen? You are a new creation. If you are a new creation, then you are completely free from the oil leaks you had before you got pumped. Amen? You, you, you are completely set free from the rust or the flat tire or, or, what, or, the, or the, the, the broken windows or I don't know whatever other example I can use, but you're not that car anymore. You're not just made new. You are a brand new creation. Amen? It's as if they took out the old for like and say, and, and Jesus gave you a new Ferrari. That, that's how it works. You are brand new. You're a new creation. You're not upgraded. So don't live every day from now on as if you are just upgraded. Do not live tomorrow as if Jesus just took your sin away. You're still the same person, but Jesus just took the, 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 the pain away. Or Jesus just took your old sin away. And then after a while, you, f you feel again as if you're still that old person. But I, I don't feel new. Why do I then still struggle with the, with the same mistakes or the same problems? That is when you have to remind yourself, hey, I'm not that person anymore. I'm made new in Jesus Christ. And you have to quote that scripture saying, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. You are new and you are born again and all things have changed. We have to understand that. So I know that you have your, your, your finger still in Mark. And I wanted to go to that scripture real quick, verse 4. Now John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism, a repentance of sins in order to obtain forgiveness and of the release from sins. Now verse 7. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is stronger, who is more powerful than I. The strap of whom sandals are not worthy or fit to stoop down and unloose. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So, so, so now we've been preaching of, of the kingdom of God and sharing with people what the kingdom of God is. But then Jesus clearly speaks to, to all the disciples, he speaks to everybody, and he says, guys, you have to be born again. I've been sharing to you the things of the kingdom, and many of you came to ask me, but how can I walk in the kingdom? How can I live in the kingdom? Nicodemus came and said, Jesus, we see you do these awesome signs, miracles, and wonders. Nobody has ever done it before, but, but how can we see it? I'm a holy man. I've worked hard to get where I am. I'm the head of the Pharisees, and, and everybody in my religious world, I'm the head. I'm the boss, but I don't even see these things happen. Demons don't listen to me. Sickness doesn't go away. I can't pray for blind eyes to open or deaf ears to open. What am I missing here? I'm serving God. I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. And he's saying, Jesus, but what am I missing? And Jesus gave him a simple answer saying, you have to be born again. You're not born again. You are not born again. You see, Jesus wants to restore you and, re and, and, and heal you from the person that you've been before you've met him. That's why he cannot give you the power of the Holy Spirit if you get rid of your old life. He first wants to allow you to be saved from your old life, the person you used to be. And then he wants to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he wants to give you the keys of the kingdom. But he wants you to become a new creation. You see, many of us lose what the Holy Spirit gives us because we still feel as, we, as if we were only upgraded. We are not a whole new creation. This morning, you have to understand, you are a new creation. If you were not a new creation, you would never be able to enter into the presence of God. 
If you were not born again, you would drop dead if you would enter into the presence of God. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that nobody could go into the Holy of Holies. Even the priests had a rope around their ankles, had bells on their garments, so that if somebody stood on the outside, they could hear the bells clinging, knowing that person is still alive. But if the priest did not sprinkle himself with the precious blood of an animal of a, or a perfect lamb, he would drop dead in the presence of God. Do you understand? So the very meaning that you can stand here and lift up your hands and worship God and praise Him and feel His presence and go into His presence is a sign that you have been born again. It's a sign that you have been saved. In the Old Testament, some of the priests would go in with sin in their lives, not forgiven, not born again, or not washed in the blood. Of course, they could not be born again, but they could be washed in the blood of an animal. Only after Jesus came could we be born again, I understand. But even they would drop dead and the people would drag them on that rope, pull them out of the Holy of Holies because they dropped dead. We have to understand that, that God is a holy God. Amen? And we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is not just a name for the Holy Spirit. That is who He is. He is a holy spirit. And He is not just a feeling or an emotion. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of a person. And that person is Jesus. And the Bible tells us that the same spirit that is in God is now in us. And we have received the same spirit that is in God. That same spirit is now here in us. The spirit that was in Jesus is now here in us. The same spirit that was in Jesus when he was walking in the desert, walking on the water, praying for the blind eyes to open, telling the sicknesses to leave, casting out the demons. That same spirit that is in Jesus is now here in me because I'm born again by the spirit and by the water. So the water is symbolizing the fact that we are putting to death our old life. And when you rise up out of the water, it shows that I'm rising up into the newness of life of Jesus Christ. I'm born again, I'm made new. But John said that I baptize you with water, but when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So let's go back in the whole story and let's speak about this. The Bible tells us that Jesus spoke to his disciples saying, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit and I need you to wait in the upper room because I want, to, want you guys to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I believe many of them have been baptized with water, but they haven't seen signs and miracles yet. But then they were in the upper room and the next moment, the Bible tells us that as they were waiting for the promise, the Holy Spirit shook the whole building, came in as a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire were on their heads and they started speaking in different languages and started praying in tongues and, and they were drunk in the Holy Spirit, walked out of that building, started prophesying and speaking, blowing on people and other people received the Holy Spirit as well. They walked and prayed for the sick even their shadow fell on people lying on death beds, and those people rose up from those beds. Everybody got healed wherever they went. It was a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I think many people have asked me, do you still believe in it? And I say, yes, of course I believe in it. Even here at church, honest, that sitting at the back, we prayed for him one morning. He said, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. So we prayed for him. The next moment, boom, he started speaking in tongues. The next moment, immediately, started praying in tongues, speaking in tongues. Many other people who come to the front saying, I, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I've never received the Holy Spirit. So it's, well, receive it today. And we say we receive and we blow on them like the Bible says that the, that the disciples did. And they receive the Holy Spirit and they pray in tongues. But, but there's people that have asked me before, but why do we need the Holy Spirit? What, what must we do? How do, we, how do I get born again? But by water and by the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm not sure if I have received the Holy Spirit yet. And, and we sit with these questions every day. That's why I thought that we've been preaching on the kingdom, but we have to get people in the kingdom. Do you see how awesome God is? He brought TBC and everybody from TBC to be here the last couple of weeks. And their main goal is to baptize people. And if I'm preaching on, on the gospel of the kingdom, here they come, baptize people, get in the kingdom. See, God is putting everything together every Sunday, every week. That is just how awesome God is. And so we baptized people last week, but now we're in this position, in this place. We are saying, Lord, now we have to equip people to walk in your kingdom. 
But the only way we can get into the kingdom is if you are born again. Look at somebody say, you ought to be born again. You have to be born again. So quickly go to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47. So my goal today is to explain this as plain as simple to you. If your children is sitting with you in the service, they need to understand the Holy Spirit. Amen? They need to know who He is, and they need to receive Him this morning. Is that okay if I do it that way? I'm going to go a bit deeper. A little bit later, but I, first of all, I want to establish a foundation and speak about the Holy Spirit. And it's difficult to explain Him because He's like the wind, <laughs> like the Bible says. And He blows wherever He pleases. But what I can say is that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. He is the most beautiful person that you will ever meet in your life, the Holy Spirit. Because He's a person. He's not a something. He's a person. And he's the spirit that is in Jesus. He's the spirit that is in God. That same spirit is now in us. But we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. He is a helper. When Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said, don't worry. I'm going to go away. I'm going to go into heaven. But he said, disciples, he said, don't worry. Do not have fear. Because I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you alone. But what I'll do is I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. And my spirit will comfort you and help you and support you. Isn't that amazing? So we have to understand that he's with us every single day, wherever we go. So I want us to read 1 Corinthians 15. I want to explain it in this way to you. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47. If you don't have your Bible, we're going to put it on the screen as well. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47. It says here, but the first man was from the earth, made of dust. He was earthly minded. The second man is the Lord from out of heaven. So why does Paul explain it this way, that there were two men, the first man and the second man? The first man, Adam, was created directly through God. Amen? I get a lot of people who ask, what Adam think? What did Adam not have what we have? A nalki. <laughs> a belly button. Just think about it for a second. Okay? He was created directly from God. I see some of you are still, I'm, I'm still, I'm, are you okay? Are you lost? <laughs> are you still on the belly button thing? <laughs> it's true, they don't have a belly button. <clears throat> but we have to understand that he was created directly from God. Now the Bible tells us that no other man was created directly from God but Jesus, that is why Jesus is called the second man. He didn't have an earthly father, but the seed was planted in the womb of Mary. How? By the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit hovered over Mary and planted the seed of God in the belly and in the womb of Mary. And Mary gave birth to Jesus. So Jesus was the second man ever created. That is also why Jesus is called the last Adam or the second Adam. Everybody with me? Okay. So the Bible tells us that the first man, Adam, was created from the dust because God took the dust and he molded the image of Adam and God blew into his nostrils the life, the, 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 the Zoe life. God breathed it into his nostrils and Adam became a living being. Amen? But now the Bible tells us, but there is a second man that came to the earth. But this second man is not from the earth. He is from heaven. Look at somebody say, he's from heaven. He's not from the earth. The second man is from heaven. Now, this is going to explain everything to you. Let, let's read it. Let's read it again. The first man was from out of earth made of dust. But the second man is the Lord from out of heaven. Now those who are made of the dust are like him who was made of the dust. They are earthly minded. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. So this tells us that there is a man from the earth, and then there's people that followed him also being part of the earth. But now it tells us that there is a second man, or the last man, and this man is from heaven. And then the Bible tells us, and so are the others who are also from heaven. So who is from heaven? It is us. It is us. We are following. Why? Because we are born again from where? From heaven. We are born again. So the Bible tells us if you are like the one that is so earthly minded, 
you are still not born again. But when you are born again, you become heavenly minded and you are like the one who came from heaven. Are you all with me? Okay. Well, let, let's go on. Now verse 49. And just as we have borne the image of the dust, so shall we and let us also. Look at somebody say, let us. Bear the image of the man of heaven. And then it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit or share in the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit or share in the imperishable. And it goes on and explains to us that if you are still the old man, if you are still the, the natural man, the earthly man, then you can never inherit the kingdom of God. But you have to be like the second man that came from heaven. So the Bible tells us that if you think of yourself today, what do you see? Are you part of the family of the first Adam or are you part of the family of the last Adam? Are you earthly like the first Adam that fell into sin, became sin, died? Or are you like Jesus who forgave us of all sin, without sin, who rose up in a new life, who's filled with the Holy Spirit. When you think of yourself, who do you see and what do you see? Do you see yourself as an earthly man who have received the Holy Spirit? Because most of us, most Christians, see ourselves that way. And we are still the earthly man, but we have received the Spirit of God in this earthly vessel. That is not true. That is a lie. I am born again. I am a new creation. I am a heavenly man who have received the Holy Spirit. Amen? Can I get an amen? We have to understand that we are new. We are born again. The Holy Spirit cannot live in an old temple. The Holy Spirit cannot live in a sinful body. The Holy Spirit can only live in a newly created person. But why do we still have the idea and the religion and the, and, and, and the mentality that we are still the old person, the lost person, the sinful person, and the Holy Spirit is trying to get me to become like the new person. That's a lie. You are new. You are born again. You are a new creation. That's why you have received the Holy Spirit. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could only come upon people. For the first time, the Holy Spirit came into a person, and that person was Jesus. He had no sin. Do you understand? And he had the blood of God, his Father, in him. You share the DNA of your father. Jesus didn't share any DNA of an earthly father. He shared the DNA of his heavenly father. And the Holy Spirit, could, for the first time, the Holy Spirit could enter into someone. That was the Holy Spirit. That could do that for the first time, entering into the body of Jesus Christ. Never before that have the Holy Spirit ever entered into a body. Only demons and evil spirits could enter into a person. Are you all with me? Because they were sinful. It was an, an, a good habitat for a demon or a wrong spirit to enter into a person. But the Holy Spirit could never enter into anybody unless they were born again. You're Jesus born again. Boom, for the first time the Holy Spirit came down but he entered into See, we have to understand that the day when we are born again, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon us, but He enters into us. And He becomes one spirit with our spirit. Amen? We have to understand that. And, and I feel I'm teaching. I'm more teaching this morning than, than preaching. But I have to do this this morning because we have to understand why we need the Holy Spirit. We have to understand why we need to be born again. We have to understand that, 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 that He is in us. And that He wants to take control of who we are. Because we are three things, spirit, soul, and body. Now, in your body, the Bible tells us that we have to put aside, our bodies must be given as a living sacrifice to do the will of the Lord. Amen? You must sacrifice your body every day. That's why we fast. That's why we do certain things is to sacrifice our bodies, push it aside to allow the Lord to do His work. And then the Bible says that we are a soul person, spirit, soul, and body. Our souls are our emotions. 
It is our thoughts. It is our five senses. It's, it's who you are. But then you are also spirit. And the Bible here tells us that, and you're welcome to go and read it, verse 45. 1 Corinthians 45, verse 45, it says, The first man, Adam, became a living being, but the last Adam, who is Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Look at somebody say, life-giving spirit. Restoring the dead to life. Now, verse 46 says, But it is not the spiritual life which came first, but the physical and then the spiritual. So the Bible here tells us that first, in the beginning, the natural life came first. The natural life. And then the spiritual life came. So in the first Adam, sin came into the world. The natural things came into the world. But when Jesus came, he came as a life-giving spirit. So let me ask you, are you born again? Because I don't want to live in the family of the first Adam. But when I am born again, I'm born again into the newness of Jesus Christ. I become who he is. I'm in his image. I receive his spirit. I'm washed of all my sins. I'm set free from all my addictions. I'm I'm set free from the person that I've been. I am a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old things have passed and the new things have come. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Where are you? Because if you are in Christ, you can be in the kingdom. Everybody with me? Is somebody receiving something this morning? Amen. Okay, let's go on. Just, just real quick, I want to share a couple of more scriptures and then I want to pray for everybody. Because I want everybody to understand what this is all about. Romans 8. Go to Romans 8 verse 1. Just real quick. Romans 8 verse 1. So people always ask me, so, so what is the job of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so now I have received the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm born again. I'm born again. I've been baptized. I've, I've received the Holy Spirit. I pray in tongues. That, that's what I do. So, so, so what now? The Bible tells us if we have received the Holy Spirit, let's keep on walking in the Spirit. You see, if you, if you walk into the kingdom of God, you have to continue walking in the kingdom of God. Amen. You must not just go in, but you have to continue walking in the kingdom of God. Because wherever you walk every day, the kingdom of God goes with you. And wherever you establish the kingdom of God, there the kingdom of God is welcome and saves people and restores people. See, it's a walk. It's a race you run every day. Wherever you go, the Holy Spirit is going with you. So I've seen many people who have done everything, but they've never been baptized with the Holy Spirit. They have never received the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible tells us many things of, of how the Holy Spirit helps us, of, of, of why He is given to us. Now, Jesus said to all of them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Isn't that true? You receive power. What happened? All of them baptized in Acts 2. They walk out of the building. Suddenly, signs, miracles, wonders take place. Why? They have received power. Secondly, in Romans 8, we can go and read it. The Bible tells us that when we are weak and when we do not know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf according to the perfect will of God for your life. I'm going to get there now. But then we go on and we read in, in Romans 8, and the Bible tells us, let, let's go and read it, Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, look at somebody say, therefore. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that is the half of the sentence. Let's read the other half that makes it complete. For therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. So it tells us here that I'm a new creation if I'm in Christ. But the only way that I can no longer be condemned is if I walk in the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is the voice inside of you every day telling you, you're born again. Telling you, I love you. Telling you, you're going to make it. Telling you, you're good enough. That's the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. 
Whenever you are weak and you have no clue what you have to do to get out of a situation, the Holy Spirit is there saying, hey, I'm with you. You can do this. You see, that, that's who the Holy Spirit is. That he's a comforter. He's a helper. He's, he's a carer. He's a, he's, he's a teacher. Galatians 5 says, when you walk in the Spirit, Galatians 4 as well says, keep on walking your walk with the Holy Spirit, who is your helper. He's your comforter. He's your teacher. He will teach you everything you need to know. That is who he is. You see, that, that you have to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit uh, uh, it should be a better relationship than anybody else or anything else that you have a relationship with. The Holy Spirit should be your closest companion. He should be everything that you need, everything that you desire. So he says, do not walk after the flesh. Now, the flesh is not just your body. It's, that's not the flesh. The flesh is sense and reasoning without the Holy Spirit. What is walking in the flesh is doing your own will instead of doing God's will. And the Holy Spirit, when you walk in the flesh, the Holy Spirit is the one saying, hey, this is not who you are. He doesn't judge you. He doesn't condemn you. But he's telling you, listen, I'm a Holy Spirit and I want you to be holy. If I'm living in you, do not do unholy things. But do what is holy. Do what is right. So when the Holy Spirit is in you, he's talking to you saying, come on, be holy. Come on, I'm in you and, and, and my work as a Holy Spirit is to make you holy as your Father is holy. And he's in you and talking with you though every day. That inner voice, that inner witness telling you. When you pray at night, he's the one is putting that, that, that person's face in your mind saying, listen, you need to pray for that person. Right now, uh, there's somebody that really needs me. Get into your car and drive to them. Go and pray for them. They're, they're in need of somebody or they're in need of a prayer or a hug. The Holy Spirit is that person. And, and we think, but am I, am, am I led by emotion or am I led by the Holy Spirit? And people struggle to get the balance between the two. Many people think, but isn't, isn't, just, isn't this just my emotion? Am I not just emotional right now? Is it my emotion or is it the Holy Spirit? The way you can test it is that the Holy Spirit works from the inside out. Emotion works from the outside in. Any amens? That's what the Lord gave me as an answer. When I, when I thought, Lord, when are you speaking to me? Is it you? Is, is, it, is it you, Holy Spirit? You see, we are three things, spirit, soul, and body. Now, the Bible tells us that the flesh is your soul. It's, it's the way you think without the Holy Spirit. Flesh is acting and saying things, your five senses. It's your soul. It, it, it's doing things without the help of the Holy Spirit. That is your flesh. But when you are led by the Holy Spirit, you do things according to the Holy Spirit, the way God would do it. Are you all with me? So our emotions are influenced by things on the outside, and then we, we, we do the wrong things. Then we become fleshly. But I'm born again. Yes, so if you are born again, you can still be fleshly. Why? In my spirit, I'm a new creation. In my body is old. All things have become new. Yes, but there's one thing that still needs to get saved every single day, and that's your soul. The Bible says, in James says, that, and in John, only the implanted word of God contains the power to save our souls. So I'm born again in my spirit, but what still needs to get saved? My soul. Is everybody still with me? The way you think, what still needs to change? The Holy Spirit, the Spirit that is in me, needs to help me to become more and more like God. I'm born again in my spirit, but I don't want to think the way I did. I don't want to talk the way I did. So when I have the Holy Spirit, He's helping me every day to become more and more like Jesus. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, is to help you to become like the Son of God. Now Romans 8 tells us that therefore if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation, and it says here, therefore there is no more condemnation for if any man is in Christ, but he must walk according to the dictates of the Spirit. He must be led by the Holy Spirit. The Bible asks us, who, is, who, who are the sons of God but those who are led by the Spirit of God? It says when we are led by the Holy Spirit that we become the sons of God. And then we read on 
And we spoke about this for a couple of weekends when we spoke about the kingdom, where the Bible says in Romans 8, verse 19, 21, that the whole earth is waiting for what? For the, re the revealing of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Those who are led by the Spirit of God. So the whole earth is in veil, is in birth pains, is in agony. You see, that's why there's droughts. That's why there's storms and volcanoes. You can see the whole earth is under stress. Why? What is the whole earth waiting for? For the sons of God to be revealed. But when am I a son of God? It's when I'm led by the Holy Spirit. It's when I'm guided by the Holy Spirit. But I am a son of God. Yes, I am, but I need to be revealed. How are you revealed? Hey, I can see that man is led by the Holy Spirit. He must be a son of God. See, the, the, the sons of God is revealed when people can see that you've given over to the Holy Spirit in your life. That is when the sons of God is revealed. Yes, I believe all of us are sons, but the world needs to see we are sons. How will they see if the Holy Spirit moves in and through us? Seeing signs, miracles, wonders. The whole earth is waiting for it. Let's go on, just real quick, verse 26. It says here, so to the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the work of the Holy Spirit? He causes us to be sons of God. The work of the Holy Spirit is to comfort us, help us, build us up. Because Jesus is no longer here. He's in heaven, but we have received His Spirit. So Jesus wants to watch over you. He wants you to be healed. He wants you to be restored. He wants you to have joy, happiness, and peace. So the way He could leave that with us is by giving us His Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The joy of the Lord is my strength. But when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in the upper room, they started praying in tongues, tongues of fire. They, were, they had joy. They were drunk with the Holy Spirit, laughing and running out of the building. Just imagine. That is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's who He is. He's full of joy, full of laughter, dancing. That's who the Holy Spirit is. And that is how we ought to be when we have the Holy Spirit. So Jesus left us with the Holy Spirit. He gave us His Spirit to be more than overcomers, to overcome the things of this world. He left us His Holy Spirit to help us through difficult times. He gave us His Holy Spirit so that we don't feel alone. Many people still feel alone. When I speak to people, saved people, they say, but I'm so alone. And I want to say, no, you're not. You have the Holy Spirit with you. Jesus said he will never leave you alone. He, but he will give you his spirit to be with you every day, to help you, to build you up. Then we get here in, 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 in one area, and I wanted to read this real quick. See what Paul says. After he said that the whole earth is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. After he says that, here he says, so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. So the Holy Spirit comes to our aid in our time of weakness. <clears throat> so too the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication and pleads on our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for uttering. So here, Paul is telling the people, people, sometimes you get into a place where you just feel lost. Sometimes you are in a time of weakness where you do not know what to pray for. How many of you have ever felt like that before? You didn't know what to pray for. You, you are just so dumbstruck with, with situations and things that have come against you that you don't know what to pray for. You do not know what to ask for. You have no idea what you have to do, and, and you just feel lost. You're saying, Lord, I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I need help. And then it tells us here that the Holy Spirit comes to us in that time. Have anybody ever felt that way before? Amen. And the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, when that happens to you, that He comes to you and He wants to bear you up in your weakness. See, that is the, the work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says whenever you pray in tongues in a church, somebody must translate or reveal what was said. For what? So that the whole church may be edified. Edified means lifted up. 
So the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit bears us up in our weakness. He lifts you up. So in the Old Testament, with all the prophets, Elisha said, the Holy Spirit came upon me and lifted me. Jeremiah said, the Holy Spirit came upon me and lifted me to see. Come on, if I close with this, then we have to receive it. Every time when, when the prophets spoke about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was the one who came to them in a difficult time, who caused them to be lifted up. Why do we get lifted up? It's so that we can see our situation from the top. Because if you are in your problem, it's always difficult to see the solution. Are you all with me? How many of you have ever been to Spur and your children took the maze with the mouse? And you, you will take a crayon and then they'll go through the whole maze to get to the exit. How many of you have ever seen it before? The maze on a piece of paper. And once the, the Lord explained it to me in that way, saying that the Holy Spirit is not just there to comfort us. It's not just there to help us or to lead us or guide us. But He is there to lift you up. He is there to lift you up. How many of you have ever been in a situation that you felt and said, Lord, I need to get out of this? Have anybody ever felt that way? Lord, I need to get out of this. I don't, I don't want to get through this. I just want to get out of this. And the Bible tells us when the Holy Spirit came upon Elisha, Elijah, Jeremiah, Hezekiah, the Holy Spirit came upon them and he lifted them up. So here he explains and he says the Holy Spirit comes in our weakness and he bears us up. And he lifts us up because, like I said, when I'm in my situation, if I am in my problem, it's always difficult to see the solution. But I need the Holy Spirit to come and rise up within me. And I need him to raise me up out of this problem so that I can see the problem from the top. Anders moet jy oudit gevat. Jy moet van boe af sien. Jy het meer idee nodig wat aangaan. And that is what we need. And when we pray in the Spirit, the Bible says that He will bear you up. The Bible says whenever you pray in the Spirit, to pray in tongues, you are edified. The church is built up and lifted up when we do it. But how many of us pray in the Spirit? How many of us feel we still have to fight our own battles? How many of us are dependent on the Holy Spirit? Can we all please stand together? And as you stand, and I'm going to close with this scripture. And I can remember at a time I was praying and saying, Lord, I know the Holy Spirit. I hear when He, when he speaks to me. One morning, I, He woke me up. The Holy Spirit woke me up. And He showed me a lady in a wheelchair in the old OK, and I saw the picture, and he said, I needed to go and pray for her. I shared this a while ago. Now, some of you might think, oh, that was just a dream, you know, this is just my, I'm just speaking to myself, that that's not God, but I felt it came from here, it came from the inside. Do not be misled and think, oh, I'm just emotional, I don't, is it, is it emotion, or is it the Holy Spirit? Emotion comes from the outside. The Holy Spirit is always from the inside speaking. So I got into my car. I drove there. And I walked into Pick and Pay. There, that exact same lady that I saw in the vision was sitting there in a wheelchair. I walked up to her. I said, lady, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I have to come and pray for you. She started bursting out in tears, crying, saying, how did you know? This morning, the Lord woke me up. And said to me that he wants to heal me, but I have to go to OK and go and wait there. He will send somebody who will listen. See, I could have made an excuse and I could have said, oh, no, I'm too tired today. I've been preaching the whole night. I'm not going to do that today. I pray for that lady. That lady got healed instantly, got up out of a wheelchair, walked around. People who knew where everybody, everywhere came to said, what happened? How did this happen? How did you get healed? The Lord completely healed her. See, that is who the Holy Spirit is. But if we are not obedient to the Holy Spirit, then He will never be able to do what He wants to do. He wants to build people up. And if we are obedient to His voice, then He will do it. 
But many people say, no, the Holy Spirit is weird. Those churches speaking in tongues, you know, and, and praying for people and, and asking the Holy Spirit to move, you know, that's just weird. That's not weird. That is church. That's me. That's me. I'm, I'm filled with that day, Holy Spirit. And I might do things people don't always understand, but that's what the Holy Spirit is. That is what a person is like when he's led by the Holy Spirit. It's like the wind that blows. You don't know where he's coming from or where he's going. But it's led by the Holy Spirit. One other morning I woke up, the Lord said to me that there's, there's witchcraft, there's voodoo all over Myrtlebrook, and I have to go and get rid of it. I said, Lord, but how, how do you want me to get rid of it? He said, don't worry, just get into your car. So that morning, I clothed, I got into my car, I just started driving. I remember I stopped at one place and there was this alley. And God said, okay, I wanted to climb out, go into the alley. I will tell you what to do then. See, that's how the Holy Spirit works. If somebody asked me, where are you going? I said, I have no idea where I'm going, but I know the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I got into that alley. There was a, I will never forget it. There was a wind blowing. And as I walked past that room, there were curtains blowing out of the room, a small shop. And the whole place was filled with mooty and, and this and this and this. And God said, okay, I need you to close the shop. And there were people sitting in the shop and the man or the witch doctor was sitting at the table speaking to them and giving them mood and many different things. So here I am. <laughs> I push away the curtains. I walk in. I said, sir, in the name of Jesus, I close this place. From today on, you will not make any money. All the powers, all the things that you have is gone now. It's over with. You no longer have any power. Only Jesus has the power to save and heal and restore. The kingdom of God is now here in Jesus' name. I said, goodbye. Have a good day. If you need any help, contact me. Here's my number. I walked out of the place and I left. I got into my car. And I said, okay, I need to, need to drive this way. I drove, got into my car. I didn't know where I was going, but I just knew the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I got into my car, here I was driving, stopped at the next stop, I said, okay, get out, I need to go in there. I walked exactly the same place, a mooty shop, or a place where the witch doctor was with all these signs and, and many different things. I said, okay, I need to close this as well. Somebody was praying for these places to close down, and, and I, I could speak to you this morning because you were obedient. So that day, I didn't know where those places were, the Lord took me to four of those places, I went into every single one of them declaring Jesus is the Savior, the only Savior. There's no other power except Him. And I said, this place will close down today in the name of Jesus. I promise you, just for a test, <laughs> I went past there the day after. The close was shut down. The place was shut down. The shop was closed. No, nobody in that place for rent. <laughs> Sticker on the window. You see, God just decided, I'm done with this. But I need somebody who will feel the same way I feel about it. I need to speak. I'm just sharing small things with you. There's many other things that I can share with you, but I needed to share this with you this morning. And I wanted to understand that, that we always preach and we always say of what benefit is the Holy Spirit to us, but what benefit are you to the Holy Spirit? If we always say, but how can the Holy Spirit help me? What can He do for me? It's not only about what He can do for us, but what can we do for Him? See, that's the missing link. How many of us can ask and wake up in the morning and say, go and do this, go and do this, go and give that guy a hug. He needs it now more than ever before. Who of us will be willing to listen to Him saying, Holy Spirit, yes, I hear you. And here we come into Revelation 22, verse 17. And John wrote Revelation. And here he's sharing many awesome things. But at one point he stopped. And he said, the spirit and the bride says what? Come, Lord Jesus. You have to get this. See, even the Holy Spirit is crying out, come, Lord Jesus. Not just come a second time. The bride who is us is shouting with the Holy Spirit, please come, Lord Jesus. Not just come a second time to establish your, 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 um, the heavens or to do this or this, but come through me, Holy Spirit. You see, John, who wrote Revelation, was on the mountain of transfiguration. 
When he stood there, he saw out of the body of Jesus a light shining that is never seen before. He saw the fullness of the glory of God being revealed in the body of Jesus. Jesus manifested himself as the Son of God on that mountain. And John saw it. And that is why John is shouting out in Revelation 22 saying, The Spirit and the Bride says, Come, Lord Jesus. Do not just come a second time, but come through me. See, that's the work of the Holy Spirit is to allow Jesus to live and walk through through you the things that he's done on the earth that it will happen through you that's the work of the Holy Spirit is come Lord Jesus come the Spirit and the bride says come Lord Jesus there's many different functions of the Holy Spirit many different reasons why he's with us but that's the number one goal is to let Jesus be revealed through you come.